the singularity, the point of infinite density at the core of a black hole, but also so much more. In mathematics, singularities come in wild and wonderful varieties. The black hole itself contains more than one. Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation was an incredible insight when he figured it out in the late 1600s. In fact, we still use it to fly spacecraft around the solar system today. However, it has its problems. Let's look at the math. Newton's equation gives you the gravitational force exerted between two masses, m1 and m2, that are distance r apart. Straightforward enough, but that r squared in the denominator spells trouble. It means the force gets larger the closer the masses are to each other. That makes sense, but what about when r gets really close to zero? Then the result of the equation, the force, becomes extremely large and is infinite when r becomes equal to zero. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Infinite force means infinite acceleration, which means, well, physics breaks. According to Newton's law, in order to feel that infinite gravitational acceleration, you need to get zero distance from an object's center of mass. That means all of that object's mass would need to be concentrated at that center. A single point of zero size, which means infinite density, and that, of course, would make it a black hole. We often use the word singularity to describe the hypothetically infinitely dense core of a black hole. But in math, the meaning of this word is much more general. You know what, instead of me trying to explain mathematical singularities, how about we get a real mathematician to do this properly? Guys, meet Kelsey Houston Edwards of the new PBS show, Infinite Series. Hey Kelsey. Hey Matt, thanks for having me on. Kelsey, the math for black holes goes to infinity for different properties and in different locations. What does this mathematical weirdness tell us? Well, mathematicians use the word singularity pretty broadly. It's really just any point that causes problems. Commonly, these problematic points are where quantities become bigger and bigger, approaching infinity, as they do near a black hole. Some singularities come about from your choice of reference frame, or coordinate system, an example of a frame-dependent singularity that might be familiar to space-time viewers is the event horizon of the black hole. I'll leave that to you to explain. Here on Earth, the North and South Pole are examples of coordinate singularities. It's possible to pass through time zones infinitely quickly, but only because of your choice of spherical coordinates. All right, that makes sense. But the gravitational singularity at the center of a black hole is a so-called real singularity, right? I mean, the curvature and the density are infinite from any frame of reference. Right. And there's no way to avoid a horrible crushing death just by switching coordinate systems. But the reality of the black hole singularity may give reason to doubt the theory that predicts such a thing. In fact, it's happened many times before. From models of the movement of water to human population growth, mathematics predicts a physical singularity and we've been forced to reject the corresponding theory. So you're saying Einstein is wrong? Blasphemy? Actually, Einstein himself agreed on this point. Guys, you should check out Kelsey's show Infinite Series, where she goes into much more depth on the nature of singularities. It's a math show, by the way, so it's sometimes about real stuff. Mathematicians are lucky. Being limited by reality is so boring. So, does the fact that it includes a singularity mean there's something fundamentally wrong with Newton's law of gravitation? Well, we already know the law isn't really so universal. When the gravitational field is too strong, say near a star or a black hole, Newton's law gives the wrong answers and we need Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is the far more complete theory of gravity. So does general relativity rid us of Newton's pesky singularity? Uh, no. In fact, it gives us even more singularities. To understand this, we need to look at something called the Schwarzschild metric. It's what you get when you solve the delightfully complicated Einstein field equations for the simple case of a spherically symmetric mass in an otherwise empty universe. We're going to simplify it to only allow movement directly towards or away from our massive object. 
In that case, it looks like this. Okay, that sure is some math. Hey, this is space-time. We can deal. Actually, it's really easy to see the singularities in this equation. But let me first walk you through what it tells us. The Schwarzschild metric allows us to compare two points or events in space-time around a massive object from the perspective of different observers. For example, a short space-time path of some object, so its world line, might move an object a distance delta r over a short time step delta t. That motion is towards or away from the massive object, which is a distance r away. That delta s squared thing is the space-time interval. And it's a strange and interesting quantity. Every inertial, so non-accelerating observer will agree on the same space-time interval for every pair of events and for every world line. We talk about this in a lot more detail in our relativity playlist. Today, we're gonna keep it simple. As long as our object's world line doesn't require faster than light motion, then the square root of the space-time interval is equal to the amount of time that the object itself feels over that interval. We call that the object's proper time. Oh, and R subscript S is a measure of the mass of the massive object. In fact, it's two times the gravitational constant times the mass. There would have been some speed of lights through the equation, but we set them equal to one because we're that cool. Now, the first thing to notice is that the singularity is still present in the Schwarzschild metric. R, the distance to the center of mass, remains in the denominator just as it was in Newton's law. When you use the Schwarzschild metric to calculate the curvature at r equals zero, that curvature is infinite. This gives us the same infinite gravitational pull as the Newtonian singularity. And just as with the Newtonian case, this gravitational singularity can only exist if infinite densities are possible. But unlike Newton's law of gravity, the Schwarzschild metric actually tells us whether or not that infinite density is expected. To see how, we need to look at the second singularity in this equation, a singularity that Newton's law does not contain. See, when distance to the center of mass is exactly equal to this rs thing, then rs over r is equal to one. At that point, the entire equation starts behaving very badly. It's as much a mathematical singularity as the one in the center of the black hole. If you haven't guessed, this bad behavior corresponds to the event horizon, and rs is the Schwarzschild radius. Imagine an object sitting at the event horizon but not moving. So its delta r would be zero. But this bracket is zero also because one minus one. The entire space-time interval for a non-moving point at the event horizon is zero. But remember, for sub-light speed world lines, the space-time interval tells us the rate of flow of proper time. So does that mean time doesn't pass for an object hovering at the event horizon? Not quite. Time certainly doesn't pass at the event horizon. No clock ticks can ever happen there. But the prohibition against objects experiencing time at the event horizon is actually a prohibition against objects spending time at the event horizon. No temporal thing, nothing that normally experiences the passage of time, can have a space-time interval of zero. At the event horizon, the only way to get a non-zero space-time interval is to have a non-zero delta r. An object at the event horizon has to change its distance from the black hole to keep its clock ticking. That means falling below the event horizon. And once inside, inward spatial movement continues to be the only way to fuel the ticking of an object's proper time clock. We'll come back to that bit of awesome weirdness in a future episode. There is one thing that can have a space-time interval of zero. Light. Actually, anything capable of traveling at light speed can only have a space-time interval of zero. From its perspective, a photon exists in a single instant, and so it can hang out at the event horizon, which also only exists at one infinitely stretched out instant. The act of crossing the event horizon is where this singularity really starts to behave badly. 
At the moment of crossing, the denominator here in the Schwarzschild metric is zero, and the whole equation blows up to infinity. But what is actually infinite here? It's nothing physical. It's the fact that even an outgoing light ray takes infinite time to move any distance. So using boring old time and distance, delta T and delta R, doesn't let us trace a world line smoothly across the event horizon. That horizon is a coordinate singularity, just like Kelsey talked about. But that means we can fix it. There are ways to construct our space-time axes so this singularity just evaporates. For example, Eddington Finkelstein taught us coordinates that compactify with the stretching of space-time to cancel out the infinities. That's a bit much for right now, but Google away, my friends. Anyway, the upshot is that it's really a breeze to drop through the event horizon, both physically and mathematically. Of course, once inside the event horizon, we still have that central singularity to deal with. Unfortunately, that one can't be done away with by a simple change in coordinates. But can that point of infinite density really exist? Actually, Einstein's theory and the Schwarzschild solution that is derived from it suggests it must exist. The apparent inevitability of this singularity may be evidence that general relativity is incomplete. But to better understand why the central infinity is unavoidable in Einstein's theory, we have to go back to that coordinate shift at the event horizon. There, the causal roles of space and time switch places, and the central singularity becomes not so much a location in space, but an inevitable future. Actually, to really get this, we're going to need another entire episode. Stand by to explore what happens when you switch the causal roles of time versus space to space-time. Cheers to Kelsey Houston Edwards for helping us understand mathematical singularities. Be sure to check out the PBS Infinite Series episode dealing with earthly singularities right here. And as always, a big thank you to our Patreon supporters for really making space-time a lot easier to do. Today, a special shout out to Henry Van Stin, who is supporting us at the Big Bang level. Henry joined us for our Patreon Google Hangout, where he pretty much obliterated the entire white hole hypothesis by correctly pointing out that if they existed in any great numbers, we would see them. Thanks, Henry, for dropping the knowledge and the dollars. It's a huge help. Last week, we inaugurated the Spacetime Journal Club by looking at Harold White et al's paper on an apparently positive vacuum test of the EM drive. The discussion continued with extreme enthusiasm in the comments, so we'll definitely be doing more Journal Club episodes. For now, let's see what you had to say. Joshua Hillerup asks why the EM drive hasn't been tested more, given that it isn't such a complicated experiment. Well, that may be true, but it's still an issue of resources. It costs a lot to do proper, careful experimental research of any type. A scientist who decided to look into this has to devote grant money, lab space, personnel, and most critically, a lot of their own time and energy. All of these are scarce in the world of research. To warrant doing this sort of effort, a given project has to be promising. The EM drive is not promising. You shouldn't mistake media and internet hype for actual potential. Most physicists just aren't excited about this because A, it shouldn't work, and B, there's no convincing evidence that it really does work. There is at best the faintest of hints. I'll come back to that in a moment. But the amount of work being done on it currently is equal to or greater than what is warranted by its promise. Meanwhile, there are many extremely promising new technologies to work on, including propulsion tech, and we don't even have the resources to give these their due attention. Aaron Schofield points out that even if the M drive produces only a tiny thrust, it's still interesting. And I totally agree. If it really does produce propellantless thrust, then it's enormously exciting. That would be true even if it's not ultimately useful for spaceflight which I'm not saying it wouldn't be. But these sorts of, huh, that's odd, moments are exactly what burst open new fields of study. 
However, it's important to remember that 999 out of a thousand, huh, that's odd, moments, are due to some unaccounted factor that is totally within our current understanding of nature. We investigate anyway, because we don't want to miss that one in a thousand. But we don't pee our pants every time. Now, the average person doesn't see most of the weird unexplainable results that ultimately prove to be nothing interesting. Scientists do. And so if they aren't getting super excited about the EM drive, it's not because they're closed-minded, it's because they know it for what it probably is. Perhaps it's worth someone somewhere investigating, but it's not worth wet trousers. A few people suggested that the EM drive has been shown to work again and again. It's just not the case. Some tests do find a thrust, although the amount of thrust isn't consistent between testers. Some tests find a thrust in the wrong direction or no thrust at all. A vacuum test out of TU Dresden in Germany observed a thrust, but found the thrust was the same even if they stood the EM drive vertically. A Chinese paper from 2010 that claimed a positive test was retracted because the authors found that the thrust vanished when the power system was placed inside the EM drive cavity. This suggested the positive result could have been due to noise due to the unshielded power system. Frankly, all of this is about what I'd expect when you generate temperature differentials and large magnetic fields around a very sensitive position measuring device. Things are going to move around. Stephen Buckman asks why we don't just put one of these devices in space to see if it works. Well, see my previous comments about devoting resources. But actually, we may have done this, or at least China may be doing it. The state-owned China Academy of Space Technology announced in December that it's testing the device in orbit. They also announced positive ground tests following the retraction of that 2010 paper. But nothing new has been published as of the making of this video. Until then, there's no way to assess this. But honestly, orbital tests don't eliminate most of the issues of vacuum chamber ground tests unless an EM drive actually manages to push a satellite around. That would be convincing. Matthew Scattity reminds us the first rule of Spacetime Journal Club is we talk over our thoughts and remain open to all possible ideas and contributions from others before forming any solid conclusions. Well said, Matthew. And remember, you are not your job. You are not how much money you have in the bank. You are not the car you drive. You are not the contents of your wallet. You are not your car keys. You are star stuff.